usually you have more money to invest than you realize. So the home equity loans, the retirement accounts, friends and family, you know, for syndicating, you have access to more money than you realize. You're listening to Investing for Good, a show that brings you the stories and strategies of people who are investing to build a legacy for their families, create a meaningful and intentional life by design, and impact the world around them. And now, here are your hosts, Annie Dickerson and Julie Lamb. Hey, everyone. Annie Dickerson here together with my awesome co-host, Julie Lamb. Julie, how are you today? I'm doing excellent. How are you? I am great, just enjoying this sunny day. It's warm where you are, right? It is, it is. I know we always talk about the weather, but I feel like the weather in the Bay Area is always changing, I know, isn't it? Right? Like it's like in the morning I'm like bundled up, I'm like freezing, it's cloudy outside, and like by mid afternoon it's like ten to fifteen degrees warmer than it otherwise yeah, would be. So Exactly. And I've actually, you know, the the last few weeks with shelter in place and homeschooling, you know, I just let my kids do like I, I let their interests lead. And so most of the time, their interests lead to us staying in the house and either playing video games or playing board games or reading or whatnot. But I'm happy to report the last couple of days, uh, my kids have really gotten into Pokemon Go, which is this mobile game where you go outside and you walk around and you capture these Pokemon (laughs) along the way. And it's funny because back when I was working in game design, um, back in 2010, 2011, before like Nike Plus and um, Fitbit and all of this stuff, we, I was working for a company where we were trying to create fitness games for kids to get mm-hmm. kids to, you know, u- use mobile games as a way to get kids to get up and moving around. And at the time, I didn't have kids. But now that I have kids, I so appreciate that. I'm mm-hmm. like, oh, my gosh, here's a game where my kids can enjoy playing this game. And it's augmented reality. So they see like the Pokemon on top of a car or by a lamppost. So it's like this this awesome magical world for them but it gets them outside and Mm -hmm. so I love that yeah anything that gets the kids excited about being outdoors and exploring nature it's funny how you know when we were kids it's like oh you just get let outside and you go play around (laughs) and explore and nowadays kids need to have an app or something to engage with the outdoors right and the same for for me when we were up in Sacramento over the summer we got uh, an app and we used it. It's like a plant dis- plant app, like one mm-hmm. that will tell you if you put the camera on, it'll tell you what kind of plant it is. And so the kids w- loved it. So they went around with my phone to every single plant. We <laughs> found like, I forget, something wild, like over 80 different species of like you know, plants and grass. In Sacramento? And, in Sacramento at the property <laughs> so... we were staying at, like berries and all kinds of wild stuff. And so, and, and, they, and they, you know, we probably spent a couple of hours like outside just exploring nature, but how fun that was because they got to learn so much and so as did I um, about you know different types of like trees and, and stuff like that so yeah, yeah it was a ton exactly. of fun exactly how fun well yeah. nobody knows kids better than our guest today Brad Tasha. he has four kids yeah I think uh, we were talking to him before the show I think his oldest is 10 and his youngest is one uh, he's got two girls and two boys and oh my gosh but I love that you know he's a he's a multifamily investor syndicator and a coach and he talks about the journey of how he got into mm-hmm. real estate and started with single family homes, but really that all along the way, his big why was mm-hmm. being able to spend more time with his family mm-hmm. and how cool that he, you know, he was working as an engineer. He had this cushy job. He was making a good amount of money and, but he wanted something more. He realized that he wanted to spend that time with his kids while his kids were still young. And here he is several years years later and he has accomplished all of that and more. He has quit his job and he's bought and sold multiple multifamily properties and he's helped other investors too and he coaches people to do what he does. So such an incredible story. I love the questions you asked him about um, you know, the types of properties they're looking at and whether they're still buying right now. Mm-hmm. I think it's 
information so many people are looking for these days. Yeah, yeah. You know, I was just curious when you've, you know, bought and bought and sold, but when you've purchased so many different multifamily properties, you, uh, you know, you start to be able to identify opportunity where others can't. And, and that's something that, um, that's how a lot of people are out there saying, oh, I can't find deals. I can't find deals. But then you look around you and you see all of your colleagues buying deals and you're wondering, how are they finding these deals? And so in in the show, I asked him that question. He gave us a list of probably like five or six different methods that he's used to be able to identify properties that other, you know, maybe other people might have passed up on. And so I feel like that was such gold. But there was another part in the show where he was talking about um, that I love where he was talking about um, when the moment came that that he realized it was time and that he had achieved his goal of, you know, surpassing his income needs and, um, and that he had replaced his income from his job and it was time for him to put his notice and what a wild time that was for him. And he has a checklist and we talked about that. And, and I totally can resonate with all of that because when I was going through that process, I had to look, you have to look at all of that. You know, you have to ask yourself like, well, what are, you know, what is everything going to cost insurance and, you know, groceries and you, you have this sort of list of of thing your your expenses and making sure that you're going to be able to to cover that when you leave and so that was really cool to kind of hear um, that behind the scenes story because I've known Brad for a while now but never really heard that that piece of it so um, yeah it was a really good good show with him absolutely such a good introduction to the real behind the scenes journey of yeah. scaling from not knowing anything about real estate to going into single family to then getting into multifamily and then doing syndications and bringing other investors in. So for all our listeners, if you are brand new to this world and you're like, I know nothing about real estate syndications or how they work, but this episode um, triggers some interest in you and you're curious to learn more, be sure to grab a copy of our book. We've saved a free copy for every one of you. All you have to do is pay shipping and handling. So just text the word book to 41404 and you'll get all the details on how you can get a copy of our book, Investing for Good. All right. And with that, let's jump into our episode with Brad Tasha. <laughs> Hey, Brad. Welcome to the show. How are you? Doing great. How are you doing, Annie? Great. We're thrilled yeah, to have you here. Um, now, Brad, I, I believe I had first met you through an apartment investing coaching program. And you I remember you were such a wealth of knowledge about acquiring and managing both smaller and larger multifamily assets. But, you know, in all the time that we had worked together back then, I don't think I ever heard the story of how you actually got into real estate in the first place. So let's start there. Tell us more about your background, I believe it was as an engineer and how you first got started investing in real estate. So my first career out of college was an engineer, a mechanical engineer in the Detroit area. My dad was an engineer and uh, in the Detroit area, it's, it's the main employment route for a lot of people. And I was really good in math and science. And uh, it, so everything kind of pointed me that way. And I always enjoyed cars and mechanical things of, uh, of any kind, really. So um, I went to college for that, got a, a mechanical engineering job right out of college. And uh, I enjoyed that for quite a while, but kind of got burnt out through the, through the Great Recession. And as that was wearing me down, all the stress of seeing people laid off and you know, I had to fire some of my employees at the time, and it was uh, it was not not a fun time. So I, I realized that I didn't want my livelihood to be entirely tied to uh, a corporation. That had me looking for a, a plan B type of thing. And really, my first rental house was an accidental rental. So we were upside down in, in equity, maybe twenty five, thirty grand, something like that. So we decided to rent it out, and we were cash flowing. I don't know, maybe, maybe a one hundred dollars per month, something like that. This was your primary month. home that you had rented yep. out, or was this yeah. a second home that you bought? Primary. It was my primary. So my my first primary house that I ever purchased uh, was turned into a rental. 
Interesting. So were you house hacking it at the time or were you just like you moved out and you rented it out? Um, I, I guess uh, I guess I did house hack uh, before I moved out and rented it out to a family. I had a friend that was renting a, a room from me for, for, I don't know, $400 a month or something like that. <laughs> um, but then, uh, then I got married. We bought a, a new house about 45 minutes away. And instead of selling the house, that's when we rented it to a, a different family. So that that's how it turned into a, a real rental house. And uh, that's when I would call it my accidental rental. <laughs> <laughs> that's such a good sign, or it's almost like an entrance exam to being like an entrepreneur or a real estate investor mm-hmm. is really, you know, you were at this point where you were almost seeing the world collapse around you, especially with the Great Recession and all these layoffs happening. You were sort of at a dead end and you were like, well, what do I do? And a lot of people who don't have that investor mindset, they're just like, well, I guess that's the end of the road. There's nothing else I can do, right? But, you know, that resourcefulness is such a big part of what um, brings success in real estate and in investing. And so just as with your story, it sounds like, you know, you were like, "Uh uh-oh, we're upside down with our equity here. You know, most people would say, okay, run away run away, just sell it, just sell it, cut the losses and run away. But you were like, hmm, okay, so we're upside down. What else can we do? Um, And so I love that story, how you turned it into something that was actually profitable for you. So then what happened next? So you you sort of had a taste of real estate. So where did you go from there? Yeah, so that was 2009 that we did that. And then, um, then the market started coming back. Uh, house prices started coming up a little bit. I actually ended up getting a promotion. Uh, I changed jobs during that time. So we were making a little bit more money at the time. So we were able to save up for more investments, which at the time, the prices of houses were so cheap compared to the rent you could get. Uh, then I purchased my first intentional rental house in a similar area. But then we were more intentional about our investing. So we were we saw that it was working well with the first house. So the um, the theory was uh, in motion. And um, so we saw it can be done. The pr- house prices are right. The rent rent prices are right. Uh, so we started adding houses at that point. And that, that was 2011 when we started ramping up the rental houses. Got it. So it was 2011 in, and this was in Detroit? Right. Yeah. Metro Detroit, uh, about an hour north of uh, the city. Got it. Got it. Okay. So at that point you were like, okay, so this model seems to work. It's giving me a hundred dollars, maybe a couple hundred dollars in cash flow every month per door. So was your plan like, okay, I'm just going to buy as many of these single family rentals as possible. And I'm just going to play Monopoly and have a whole bunch of greenhouses all over Detroit. Was that the plan? You're exactly right. Yeah, it was. Uh, I had read the Millionaire Real Estate Investor book uh, by Gary Keller. A fantastic, uh, probably to this day, still my favorite real estate book. And it really motivated me. So it had a lot of a uh, strategy in there. Some of the numbers that help you work through the profitability of rental houses and some really good strategy in there. And yeah, it was, so the plan was one house a year, add them up, add them up. So that, that was the plan at the time. So then, because Julie and I, we know how this story ends or how where you are today. So these days, you're not, as far as I know, you're not continuing to do one single family per year. You're doing way more than that. So tell us about how that arc happened. So at a certain point, I believe you were at like four or five houses. Then all of a sudden you got into multifamily. So tell us about that journey. How did that come about? We got up to five rental houses and I was the first three I was managing myself. I was the repair man. I was the leasing agent. I was, uh, I was everything. So I really burnt myself out. You know, we had a couple kids at the time and I just didn't have enough time to do everything anymore. So, um, we bought a couple more houses and had a property manager for those two houses. And I could see that that model was a lot more sustainable. You know, the profitability wasn't quite as high because you're paying a property manager, but 
uh, it, we were still making really good money on them, but uh, someone else was doing the day-to-day managing and leasing and things like that. So um, I saw that that model worked much better. And then around, uh, I guess, 2014, I had met a couple other local investors that were in multifamily, and uh, that that a light switch kind of went off then when I met these people that were actually buying these apartment buildings. At the time, I thought, no, nobody can afford these huge apartment complexes. And, you know, I just thought that was, uh, you know, for hedge funds and, and REITs and billionaires. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, then, then I met these real people who were doing this and it was cool to, you know, really hear how they were, how they were doing it. And that kind of led to my transition into multifamily. And then these people that you met, were they doing like, what size multifamily were they doing? Were they doing like five units, 10 units, 100 oh, units? See. They were doing uh, 10 to 20 units and then maybe one 50 some odd unit okay. at the time. Like, so they, they were kind of early in their multifamily career too. Got and it. Were they syndicating those deals or were they just purchasing them th- themselves? A little bit of both, a little bit mm-hmm. of both. So I was introduced to syndication at the time. Uh, good question, Julie. It was, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, a little bit of both. I think they're both of those guys, their first deals purchased on their own. Mm-hmm. And then after that, they uh, they started syndicating. I, I wasn't ready for syndicating just yet. I, <laughs> I didn't have the confidence uh, level for that at, yet at that point. But that led me to looking more into multifamily, reading every book I could find and, um, Really, I couldn't find any meetups or anything, and even even podcasts back then, there really weren't that many to to look to. So these local guys were really the catalyst to to going into it. And then books, it was reading, 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 and then that led me to going and purchasing a, a twelve unit apartment here in Metro Detroit uh, on my own. So that that was my first venture into into multifamily. That's like 12 years all at once. You were going to do one door a (laughs) year and then you all of a sudden you bought 12. That's incredible. So then with that one, you must have seen like, wow, I can really scale this thing much faster with Mm -hmm. multifamily. Was that what you saw? Exactly. And, and another thing that we were doing along the, along the way there while we were buying the houses was uh, the Dave Ramsey program. Mm -hmm. So the, his uh, financial uh, planning method of paying off all your debt and you know saving up your emergency fund and all of that. Well, we ended up paying off our house, and it's like woohoo, house is paid off. But really, our life didn't change that much when our house was paid off. I, I still had to go to work. Um, <laughs> I still needed the that W two income. You know, it's we were very financially stable at the time, but it it really didn't allow a, a big life change at that point. We could afford vacations and whatnot, but uh, it didn't, it didn't free my time up at all. I still needed to work a full-time job. So at that point, we ended up taking a home equity loan to purchase that 12 unit building and leverage that paid off house that we had to buy a a 12 unit building where one of these buildings that I thought I could never afford. And I had the money right, right in front of my fingertips there. And I I didn't even realize it. So (laughs) That's one thing I encourage people to do is uh, look around. You, you probably have more money to invest than you realize. Right. And that comes back to that resourcefulness. I think a lot of people would have said, well, I don't have any money in the bank. I can't buy a 12 unit. And then mm-hmm. you and your wife were like, wait a second, we have all this equity here. Let's tap into that. Mm-hmm. So that I love that resourcefulness is a common theme in your story. But one thing I wanted to dig into was you said that when you first met those people um, who were investing in multifamily and some of them were syndicating, when you were first introduced to it, you were like, oh, I can't do that. I'm not ready for that. And I think so many of us, when we first get um, into the world of syndications, we think, Oh, we can't, I can't, I can't do that. Nobody would ever invest with me. How could I ever possibly do something that massive, right? So first you decided, okay, I'm going to buy my own multifamily property. You read a lot of books. Was there anything else that you did along the way to eventually, because now you do syndicate properties and you have multiple multifamily properties under your belt. So how did you get to that point where you were ready and you were confident enough to go out and say, okay, I'm ready to bring investors in with me on these deals. 
my my intention never was to syndicate deals really it was it was really my own uh my own path that i was trying to build up these these properties and just build up a, a big apartment portfolio for myself to uh to replace my job income well at some point i ran out of money <laughs> <laughs> so that was really my what made me switch gears into syndication for for a while and um we found a deal that we couldn't pass up. It was a 50 unit deal that, uh, for 1.1 million, we knew we could turn it around for, I don't know, maybe 1.9, 2 million, uh, within a few years. And we're like, wow, this deal is just too good to pass up. Um, it was an off market deal that was just one, one we couldn't turn down. So I, I syndicate and, and buy most of my apartments with a, a single partner. And we, we were both low on money at the time because we had purchased a couple other properties, uh, you know, six months prior to that. Um, but we were putting our heads together and, okay, well, this deal is so good. We have to buy it. We just uh, need to find the money to do it. And we, we knew of syndicating, but that really made us dive in and, and learn it. That, that started our syndicating adventure. So at some point in there, I know you quit your job. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So tell so, us uh, about that. Yeah, good question. That was May of 2017. So at that point, I had re- replaced my income um, with just my own apartment building properties. Mm-hmm. So that was the time where I thought it was a good idea to, to quit my corporate job. And it, it was uh, it was kind of a scary thing, actually. Uh, to make that jump. You know, everyone talks like, uh, when I get that amount of income from my investments, I'm out of there. Like, no no hesitation, I'm gone. But, you know, when uh, when I was really coming up to that point, I'm like, holy cow, It's, it's act- this plan is actually working. <laughs> uh, man, this is actually going to happen. I put about a 10-step a checklist together uh, before I would call it quits at my job. And it was, you know, things like pay off this, Car, research the health insurance for my family, buy one more multifamily property. You know, it, it was a handful of things like that. And I'm ticking down the list going, holy cow, this is really happening. Holy cow. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's sometimes when a plan works, it's uh, it's actually shocking. You know, like it works for yeah. other people, right? But mm-hmm. this this won't work for me. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I was checking the, checking the checklist off. I'm like, holy cow, I have to put my notice in at work. <laughs> And it happened so quickly, right? Because you said, I'm doing the math over here. So you quit your job in 2017, but you said you bought your first rental, I think in 2011, right? So what took most people, what takes most people 40 plus years to be able to save up for retirement, you were basically able to do in five or six years, replace your entire income. That's wild. Yeah, yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's yep. crazy. So then when you retired or you quit your job, what did you do? Did you just do did you sit on the beach? Did you stay <laughs> what, how did your life change after that happened? Well, let's see. So at that point, uh we had three kids. So uh a lot of my time was chasing kids around <laughs> at home. <laughs> um so it was far from sitting on the beach, but you know, family time was my main goal. Uh, more, more family time. So that that's uh, that's what I had a lot of um, immediately. And then um, at that time, I had met uh, Michael Blanc and started uh, coaching for him with him in his program. So uh, it was a perfect. I, I just happened to meet him right before I was going to put my notice in at my job. And we put our heads together and he used to do all the coaching himself. And then he was looking to hand off the coaching uh, to someone else so that uh, he could focus on his investments, his syndications. Mm -hmm. So that was a great part-time thing I could do from home. Didn't have to drive to an office. I could help people do it, what I've done. And it, it was a perfect timing for that. I love that. Can you tell the audience maybe a little bit about how, did you coach with him or you just coached for him? For him. Um, for him. I, I never took his program before that. Okay. Um, so I was, I was learning most of my, uh, most of my investing on my own through books and networking and, and things mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but then we happened to, to meet and put our heads together and how 
I could take over coaching for him. Okay, got it. And how long did you do that for? I'm still doing it. So, oh, nice. um, so a little, little, little bit over three years now that I've been doing that. So it's, it's pretty satisfying. You know, some of mm-hmm. my students have more, more units than I do. <laughs> so that, that's, always, that's a good sign. I would say I feel good when that, when they pass me up actually. <laughs> Yeah, it's so exciting. Same for us in our business, um, you know, where we help people learn how to do what we do as well. And um, we've got a lot of people. We've been have the course now for a little over a year, and we're watching people just, you know, surpass us too. And uh, it's wild to watch people put everything into motion and watch it all kind of come to come together. Mm-hmm. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, there's there's enough uh, buildings out there for everyone. So I'm all for. <laughs> people passing me right up you know mm-hmm. it's a there's a work-life balance that I like to try to keep and it's a fun game <laughs> yeah well speaking of work-life balance so when you're coaching all these students what sorts of whether it's related to real estate investing or their w-2 job or otherwise what are some of those hurdles that you see people bump up against in getting started in real estate and syndication that you're seeing over and over again let's see well there's the people thinking they don't have money to invest i'd say that's a, a huge one um you know so we start exploring the um the home equity loans like i did the retirement accounts, whether it's a self-directed uh, type of account or a, an account that they can pull cash out of and even pay the taxes and penalties. That, that's where I got some of my investing money as well, is taking it from retirement accounts, uh, paying the fees, that, but the deal's good enough where you make it back so quickly. And people thinking they don't have money when they really do. The confidence to put in offers, the confidence to talk to brokers, um, I would say, that's something I, I try to work through with people is uh, really, really getting the confidence to pick up the phone and talk to these brokers uh, because it can be intimidating when you don't know the lingo and you don't think they're going to take you seriously. So that's another one. You know, there's natural tendencies, natural strengths that everyone has. Uh, I find, you know, most of uh, what we do in this industry is we're either looking for deals or looking for money, right? Mm-hmm. I find that most people gravitate toward one or the other. They're, they're, better at one than than the other. So if someone is really good at uh, finding deals, but not as much on finding money, I usually encourage them to partner up with someone that has the opposite strengths. And man, I find that most successful people in our industry have partnered up with someone that has complementary skills. Mm -hmm. And that tends to really lead to like a rocket ship of, of success. Yeah, I feel like that's so much of, of how Annie and I work and how we actually were drawn together was, was based really on that, was based on you know her strengths and, and my weaknesses and each other's strengths offsetting the weaknesses. And it's funny, I heard that on a podcast. It might have even been you who said that. Um, I heard it on a podcast like many years ago, like back in 2016, 2017. And um, they said, you know, if you can find somebody who has the weaknesses that offset your strengths and, and vice versa, that that together you guys can be like this powerful Mm -hmm. team and that always stuck with me and then lo and behold like a year or two later I met Annie and there there it was and then here we are today Um, but I I certainly agree I see that so much in our industry and what we do um, in multifamily specifically where you see those partnerships come together and it's just like you know beautiful things happen when that when that partnership forms so yeah, you can do this industry on your own, but I find that uh, one plus one equals three in this uh, in this equation. Really, you know, it, it gets lonely. There's uh, <laughs> the you know your only accountability is to yourself at that point. Um, you know, you don't have anybody to share the. Uh, I mean, there's your spouse, but to share those victories and really know what some of the struggles of getting a new property or. Um, Turning, turning a property around and making it worth uh, a tremendous amount more than when you bought it. There's just so so many facets to partnership that I, I can't uh, emphasize it enough. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I want to kind of spend a little bit of time talking about, before we have to move on, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the types of deals that you guys do and how you, how you evaluate opportunities. And then I want to talk lastly a little bit about what you see happening right now in the multifamily space with everything we, we have going on. So you bought, so you said you bought that, that 12 unit on your own and it was in Detroit. And I, I remember looking at Detroit back in 2016 thinking, 
I would never invest there because it looked so crazy and, and wild and, and risky, really. But I'm in California and you're a lot closer. But tell us about how you, what you were looking for when you were looking to buy that first apartment. Like what were sort of some of the metrics? So if anybody out there who you know is thinking about, hey, I want to buy my first small apartment building, what are some of the things that I might be looking for? You know, what, what did you do in the beginning? And then tell us about um, what you do now. Sure. So a um, couple things. The the Detroit market, there's the city, which is gets all the headlines and the bankruptcy uh, mm-hmm. that it went through right around that time that you're talking about, too. Um, so I, I don't invest in the city of Detroit. It's all okay. suburbs. So since about 1950-something, uh, people have been fleeing the city and going into the suburbs. So if you look at the city of Detroit, the population has been going down and down and down and down. But then if you look at the suburbs, that's where everyone is going. So it's not that people are necessarily uh, fleeing Michigan, but they're they're moving outward toward the suburbs. So the suburbs are getting a lot of benefit of uh, of that population transfer. Um, So that 12 unit is in Monroe, Michigan, about 45 minutes south of the city of Detroit. It's a city of about 35,000 people, not humongous, and it's, uh, I wouldn't say it's my perfectly ideal city that I would invest in, but it was a great first deal for me. This, it was a 10-year-old property, so very new. I was looking through listings, and it had a really terrible picture from the main road, uh, from the back of it even. You could barely even tell it there was an apartment building there. Uh, i showed up there when I was looking at it, uh, the, a beautiful, brand new property. And holy cow, they were uh, condos that were tra- switched into apartments in the downturn. So they were intended to be just sold off as condos individually. They were turned into apartments by by need because of, no one was buying them in the recession. So uh, what appealed to me was the condition. I mean, it was a beautiful property, the cash on cash return. So at that point in my investing career, my main metric was cash on cash return. So I, I was going to put, I think it was about 175 grand to buy that particular property, uh, the down payment and closing costs. So I need this money to work for me if I'm going to build up the income to quit my job. So my main metric at that point was cash on cash return. So up until I quit my job, that that was my main metric. So now as my uh, investing has progressed and the buildings we buy now aren't going to my day-to-day costs, it's really more net worth building type of investing at at this point. So now it's, uh, it's more of a uh, internal rate of return or the uh, annual rate of return. Those are more more what I like to focus on these days. Uh, cash on cash is good, but really the overall return is w- more what I'm interested in these days. Got it. Okay. That makes perfect sense. I feel like for me too, I'm right there with you, you know, looking at newer properties that don't have a lot of like CapEx repairs, things that aren't going to give me a lot of headaches, um, but that have a high cash on cash return. I've already left my job. I left my job a couple of years ago, but we're trying to transition my husband now out of his job. And so that's the same mm-hmm. for us is that focus is the cash on cash return. And I think it's really important for everyone out there to, um, you know, who's thinking about trying to transition away from their jobs to really prioritize that cash on cash return. If you know, if it doesn't meet that metric and your goal is to leave your job, then it might not be a good fit for you. And you also don't want to be burdened with a property that has a lot of, you know, CapEx repairs where after you quit your job, you're going to be getting phone calls from the property manager saying you've got to replace the roof and the plumbing and the HVAC and all of these big expenses. So, so I love that. Tell us a little bit about the asset classes that you guys focus on and, and are you guys doing value add or are you looking more at cash flowing, you know, newer properties? or what are you guys buying right now? That's a fantastic question too. Um, so previously we were looking at B and C class properties. So we we were more interested in the returns and really uh, B or C rough or clean. We, we would look at any any deals like that. And really as, as I've invested more and more, I've come to appreciate the B class markets much more than the C. Mm-hmm. So even if the C class has higher returns, it's so much more work and there's so much more risk in the, you know, because they're generally in worse. That's what naturally C class areas are. They're rougher areas than, uh, than B class. So we've actually sold off a couple of our C class assets, you know, and looking to 
1031 exchange those that money into B class areas. They're so much easier to manage. The cash flow is much steadier. The C class we've seen much more of a roller coaster of income and um, the tenant base is a lot harder to, to deal with, you know, both just uh, issues at the property, uh, the rent uh, consistency, filling vacancies is easier in the B class areas, more desirable areas. So um, I would say our last four or five purchases have been really solid B class uh, areas that, that are uh, desirable and, um, you know, the much easier to manage, consistent value add point, Julie. Um, every single deal we buy has a value add component of some kind, every single one. So we don't buy anything if there isn't some sort of value to be added, whether it's increasing rents or uh, decreasing expenses through, you know, energy savings or uh, better property management structure. Um, you know, one property we bought had it was a 63 unit. It had a full-time property manager, a full-time maintenance guy, a half-time maintenance guy, just way over payrolled for this building. Um, and it was a nice, easy expense reduction just to put a normal property management structure on there, a part-time management and maintenance structure on there. So that was an awesome value add uh, property that we bought. The Laundry facilities, we've ended up purchasing a lot of our machines where we're getting most of the income now instead of the 50-50 splits like uh, like some do when they're leasing leasing the, the units. Every deal we buy has a, some kind of value-add component to it, and, and that's our cushion. If we go into a downturn, you know, I want to – if we buy a property at, uh, you know, a million dollars, let's say, uh, I want to be able to make it – worth 1.2, 1.3 million. And if we hit a downturn, maybe, maybe then it comes back down to a million where we, where we bought it at. Yep. So that, that's our cushion that we make sure each property has. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm curious, you know, one of the sort of secret sauces, everybody's always talking about how they can't find deals right now. And, and, and that's always been the case. I mean, I feel like everybody's always said, oh, I can't find deals, even though some, obviously there's a lot of groups who are finding deals. What, it, was there anything along the journey over the last couple of years where you were able to identify something that maybe another buyer wasn't that helped you guys really make the property, you know, really blow up in terms of, of value? And what did that look like? Well, let's see. So there was that payroll one that I was talking about. That was a mm-hmm. that was one that other people were passing up. But a day one, um, it was about a million dollar add in value on that Oof. property just by changing just changing management wow. companies. Day one, it's worth a million dollars more. It was it was on the market. It was a LoopNet deal. You know. Oh my goodness. People say, <laughs> Right. find a deal on LoopNet, right? Well, mm-hmm. there was a million bucks we made on LoopNet. Uh-huh. Um, let's see. Uh, another, some other deals we found on the MLS, you know, a 23 unit and a 30 unit, really properties that should not be listed on MLS. That's really not the, the most efficient way to sell something of, of that size. Mm-hmm. Um, so we happened to come across those there. Um, our 50 unit we got on a Facebook group. <laughs> it was an off market oh deal we, we found on a Facebook group. Uh, someone said, uh, do you have any, anyone interested in a 50 unit, uh, in Lansing, Michigan? Like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see some other methods. Um, really, I mean, just talking to brokers, we, we've, uh, got some on market deals, off market deals. Um, one one was kind of funny that I was deleting my spam email and I happened to see a 52 unit building for sale and I hit I hit delete as as I was hitting delete and it went away like holy cow did I see that was I dreaming that and uh, I I looked on the company's website and it wasn't there so I think it I know I saw that. So we, we called up that broker and like, oh, yeah, we just listed this property. It's uh, right uh, down the street from another one you guys have. We were, yeah, so we're just ready to start our marketing on it. And uh, so we put a full price offer in. It was a great deal. And so we just happened to happen to snag that one that way. This year we purchased two two complexes. One we got from a direct mail campaign that we put out. One was uh, from a broker we've used to uh, sell one of our properties before. So 
Um, each, you know, every property you buy has a story of some kind. I, I find that there's so many different stories uh, to each property. It's, but um, really, brokers are control most of the deals. So it's making a good relationship with with brokers is uh, is the, really the best bang for your buck. I love that. I think there there is so much in there that you know everyone can take away because I think I think everyone always thinks there's really two ways, right? It's going through a broker or direct mail campaign. That's it. And you know, we, you talked about you know identifying the property management issue, right? So really digging into the numbers and trying to figure out what's what's hiding in these numbers that's either higher, you know, than it should be, or where is it too low? And really trying to identify the opportunity. I feel like is a real really good kind of undercover way to identify deals where other people might just on the surface kind of pass up. Um, you talked about the MLS, like that's another great place, right? To look for larger units that shouldn't be listed there. Facebook groups, I feel like a lot of people think, oh, who's going to find a deal in a Facebook group? But, you know, clearly that worked as well. So so I love all of that because I think that, you know, right now I think there's way more money out there than there are deals. And I think that if anyone out there who's mm-hmm. looking for deals wants some tips on how to, how to identify deals, those are, those are some good suggestions. So I love that. Can you tell us a little bit about what your opinion is around, you know, they, they talk a lot about now about people moving out of like the downtown. And it sounds like you were already kind of doing that way long before you were investing in areas, not like downtown Detroit, but you were really investing in these suburb areas. But now that's the big talk of the town, right? Because everybody is realizing they don't need to be downtown close to the jobs. And, you know, people are kind of expanding outward and and moving into these suburbs. So do you feel like that's something that will, is a trend that will continue to last number one? And do you feel like this is something that has positively impacted the value of the properties that you own? Yeah, I do. I do think it's, uh, it's helped us a lot. We focused on these areas because we were most familiar with them, really. It wasn't, we didn't have a crystal ball and think uh, everyone's going to rush toward the suburbs. It just happened. We, we got lucky in that, in that regard. But uh, as far as COVID goes, yeah, it's, uh, it's much, um, the areas where our buildings are are actually a uh, much lower, uh, lower rate of infection and of COVID in those areas. So they're, um, I do think it's helping our uh, our property values in that area. Um, I, I have seen that in my research as well. Um, quite a few uh, people seem to be moving from the dense city where you're um, where you're using elevators with people, really close contact with people um, to the mm-hmm. suburbs. Uh, so one thing I, I like to look at in buildings lately is uh, separate entrances, so you're not. Um, so n- no elevator is nice. Um, ent- separate entrances to uh, to each unit is nice if if you can, um, or or maybe like a small common area um, to just get into a few units or something like that is uh, it is it's a benefit. I-, I wouldn't say I would totally avoid something with an elevator or or a common area, but um, at this point in time, right now. Um, I think that uh, suburban, spaced out living is a, is a little more appealing. We'll get back to our conversation with Brad in just a minute. Have you been thinking about investing in real estate, but aren't sure you have the time or the desire to manage the investment? Perhaps you're afraid, like we were, that you'll make the mistake of choosing the wrong market or the wrong team and lose your entire investment. Well, that's exactly why we created the Good Egg Investor Club. We do the work of identifying solid real estate investment opportunities in the best markets around the country and then partner with you to acquire these investments and then we'll all share in the returns. We'll identify the growing markets, strong, experienced teams, and the solid deals. We do all the heavy lifting of managing the tenants and the renovations, and as a passive partner, you get to enjoy all the benefits of investing in real estate, monthly cash flow, long-term appreciation, and the ongoing tax benefits. When we first discovered passive investing through real estate syndications, we realized it fit perfectly into our busy lives. We could put our money to work for our families, work less, and get more time back in our days so that we could focus on what matters most and discover our true passion and purpose in life. We've now helped hundreds of people invest passively in real estate syndications and are seeing the positive impact it's had on their lives. 
We invite you to partner with us by joining the Good Egg Investor Club today so you can start putting your money to work for you and get more time back in your day. Because we know that when people have more time in their days, they can do the true work they were intended to do and the world will be a better place. To sign up for the Good Egg Investor Club, go to goodegginvestments.com slash invest and we'll take it from there. That's goodegginvestments.com slash invest. And now, back to our chat with Brad Tisha. And I'm not asking you to look into your crystal ball, but I'm just curious, like, you know, you've been in the industry a little bit longer, I think, than Annie and I have in multifamily anyway. You know, what do you think is happening right now with multifamily and where do you see it heading in the next, you know, year to two years? You know, I I look at some projections from uh, some of the industry research firms like CoStar, and they show kind of a dip coming toward the middle of next year. Mm -hmm. Um, And I try to think out what what is going to cause that. And um, you know, there there are a few things that impact our our values, and so there's cap rate, which you know are, are very much correlated with interest rates, and I don't see interest rates going up, so I I don't see cap rates uh, going up for that reason, but uh, so I feel like those research areas are thinking more of the income going down on Mm -hmm. the buildings, so NOI going down, and I guess that would be unemployment running out or uh, the government stopping the, the extra unemployment benefits, but Man, I we haven't seen a, a drop in our rents at all yet. Mm-hmm. So um, even since uh, at the end of July, when uh, when the extra unemployment money stopped for a while, there's still a little bit out there. We we haven't seen a drop in our in our uh, expected income at, at all yet. Mm. So, um, you know, we we've got uh, a fair amount of equity cushion and. Uh, debt coverage ratios on our properties where we could take a hit and still be just fine. But there, there's a lot of predictions predicting a downturn, but I, I just haven't seen it yet. You know, there's uh, quite a housing shortage in the in the country right now. The house prices are crazy high in many areas. Um, so there are all sorts of things that are benefiting the apartment industry that are help keeping keeping things afloat where you know, I, I haven't seen the beginning of a downturn yet. And, you know, it, it sure could come, but <laughs> I, I don't see anything that's uh, imminent. And are you guys going to continue to buy over the coming years? I mean, if the deal pencils, are you guys still on still buying mode? Absolutely. Um, we closed on one deal last month. We closed on one this past Friday. Mm-hmm. If we find a good deal, we're, we're still going to go after it. Awesome. Awesome. I love that. Well, for everybody listening, if you're out there and you're, you know, hesitating and thinking maybe it's not now is not a good time to buy, um, you know, here you've got an expert sitting in front of you telling you that uh, if the numbers make sense that he's still buying and so are we. So, so I love that. All right. Well, Brad, I could continue to, to tap your brain for so much more, but we need to move on. Um, let's move into the investing for good impact round. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions around investing for good. So the first one is investing in yourself. So what is one way that your investments have helped um, you know, your life be more fulfilling and satisfying, I guess? Really more, more family time is, uh, is number one. That was my number one reason. That was my why for, uh, going after this in the first place. Um, mm-hmm. so getting to see my kids grow up, spending a lot more time with my wife. Um, you know, when I was, I would leave at seven in the morning with my corporate job, get home between six and seven at night, you know, so you're mm-hmm. gone 11, 12 hours a day. So you miss a lot during that time. Um, so that's, that was my why and continues to be my why today. Mm -hmm. I remember seeing a Facebook post that you had posted a a while ago um, about, you know, just being able the flexibility that, you know, investing in real estate gives you and, and, uh, you know, wondering why more people (laughs) aren't doing it. Um, And that's something that, that Annie and I always wonder too, which is why we have the podcast and why we do all of this work so that we can help more people get into Mm -hmm investing and free up their time. Okay. Second question uh, is around investing in others. So help our audience by giving them one, maybe investment strategy or a life hack or something that you think can help them, uh, you know, catapult their investing journey. 
You know, we've touched on a, a few of these things, and it's uh, usually you have more money to invest than you realize. So mm-hmm. um, the home equity loans, the retirement accounts, friends and family, you know, for syndicating, uh, you have access to more money than you realize. You know, and then there's there's a fear component. I think many or most people don't invest in real estate because of the fear writing a $30,000 check to buy a rental house or a $100,000 uh, to join a syndication or a couple hundred thousand to buy a small apartment complex yourself. Most people are scared out of their mind to take money out of a retirement account and do something like that. But once you, once you really understand uh, the power of multifamily and how, how quickly you can uh, make that tax hit come back to you and then now now you have that money tax free for for the rest of your life you know there's so many benefits that that people need to understand and and reading reading books so millionaire real estate investor to me was really that that one i would say was one of my real breakthrough mental uh mental things that helped me yes, I'm going to invest in real estate. Yeah. I always say, you know, when we think about why people don't want to make the move into investing or syndication or, you know, single family homes or whatever, it's always because of a lack of education. I know that's true for me when I, you know, I'm considering a new asset class. If I don't feel comfortable pulling the trigger, I ask myself, well, why not? And I always come back to the same thing. And the answer is I don't know enough about it. And when you don't know enough about it, you don't feel empowered to make a decision. And so I love that because I think all too often people think that they should have all the answers and that they should just know, but we don't. And the way to get the answers to feel comfortable to invest is to educate yourself. So I love that. Okay. Last one is around investing in the world. So what is one thing that your investments are doing right now to make the world a better place? Well, every, every property we buy, we try to, uh, to fix it up, make it a great place for people to live. So this, uh, specifically these B class, uh, buildings and areas that we're investing in. We really want uh, these to be uh, desirable places to live, you know, people or places where people are feel safe to come home, to be proud to have someone over and say, this is where I live. You know, we're, we're not slumlords by any means. We want to give people really nice, clean, uh, desirable places to live at, at an affordable price, you know? So, um, Really, that's that's what we're trying to do is make really nice, affordable housing for people because there's quite a shortage of that out there. Um, nobody can build a B-class building right now and make it profitable. So if it costs one hundred and fifty thousand dollars plus per unit to to build something like that, most of them that we're buying are between fifty thousand and eighty thousand per per unit that we buy, and you know so the supply of these is not getting higher. It's um, if anything is getting lower as uh, buildings get torn down in certain areas and things like that. Yeah. That purpose driven investing is exactly why Julie and I are in this industry and why we do all the work we do, because it's really a, it's one of those few situations in life where you have a true win, win, win. It's a win for us, win for the investors and a win for the local community. So it's like that deal you said you can't turn down. Well, we can't turn down doing these value add um, opportunities because we have such an opportunity like you do to make a difference and make an impact. Um, in the lives of our, our investors as well as in the community. So I love that. That resonates so much with everything that we do. So Brad, uh, tell our listeners if they wanted to pick your brain further or they wanted to connect with you, what's the best place that they can go to learn more about you and all that you're doing? Um, let's see, a couple places that I would uh, that I would tell people to go. Um, so they can anyone can email it email me anytime. So just my name spelled out at gmail.com. So B-R-A-D-T-A-C-I-A at gmail.com. And then uh, I've got a Facebook apartment group that, uh, so it's Apartment Investors of Michigan. So we, we try to share some local knowledge in there of our, of our markets and what we're seeing in, uh, in Michigan here. So those are a couple places I'm uh, reachable at uh, online. 
Awesome. And for the listeners, as you heard, don't discount those Facebook groups because you can find really good deals in there sometimes. So go join Brad's group and reach out. I'm jealous you actually got bradtasha at gmail.com. That's pretty impressive. (laughs) I had to get creative with my name. Um, But reach out to Brad. He's a wealth of knowledge. Brad Tasha, multifamily investor, father of four syndicator and coach. Brad, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thanks, Annie. Thanks, Julie. It's really great talking with you. You've been listening to Investing for Good, the number one podcast for people like you who are investing to build a legacy for their families, create a meaningful and intentional life by design, and impact the world around them. For more resources, check out goodegginvestments.com slash podcast. And be sure to join the Investing for Good Facebook community. And don't forget to subscribe and give us a five-star review so we can continue to bring you amazing new conversations every week. Until next time, keep investing for good.